Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm taking a break from creationists and religious apologists and looking at a flat earth documentary called Level. And no, it's not a coincidence that I'm doing this the same week that the God Awful Movies podcast covered it. I like to watch the movies they cover before listening to the podcast, this one was available on YouTube, and it was just, well it was too much for me to not want to make a video of my own about it. And just some housekeeping, I have decided to try using my 3D print time lapses as a background instead of my usual stuff, for multiple reasons. The response to my suggesting this a while ago was generally positive, so I'm going to give it a go for this one. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Kinda wish YouTube allowed comment section polls, that would be really helpful for something like this. Anyway, let's go! Okay, I'd like to start off by addressing the fact that this video is in glorious 360p resolution. Now, it says here that it's available in HD and uncensored on Vimeo and LevelTheFilm.com, and apparently it's coming soon to Blu-ray. Well, LevelTheFilm.com doesn't seem to, you know, work. I couldn't find it anywhere on Vimeo, and although I definitely would not give anyone money to purchase a Blu-ray for this, it doesn't appear that this is even an option. So yeah, it's a bit blurry, but mostly I just find it funny that none of the methods for watching this video are available anymore except for YouTube, and they didn't even successfully keep their website up and running, which is not a hard thing to do. Do you believe this is a real live recording? Do you believe about now? Does this make it more believable? I love the implication here that the only reason we believe the videos from NASA is because they have the NASA logo on them. I think this is supposed to be a dig at the live stream from the ISS, which you can watch anytime they don't have network issues, which do happen from time to time. I mean, they're frickin' live streaming from orbit, man. Like, of course they're gonna have network issues every now and then. Flat Earthers don't like the fact that this stream exists, so they just claim that the whole thing is faked. You know that starting at the end of 2015 through 2017, Flat Earth was one of the top search terms in the USA, let alone the world. No, I didn't know that. Probably because it's not actually true. Well, I mean, depends on what you mean by one of the top, I suppose, but it didn't make the top 10 in 2016 or 2017, and it was consistently beaten by search terms such as boobs or Star Trek, and not by a little bit either. And as popular as boobs were for this time period, and presumably still are because, you know, boobs, boobs did not reach the top 10 either, and even for some of these top 10, which, let's face it, the top 10 are usually pretty short-lived search terms that are based on trends, but even Pokemon Go managed to pass boobs several times after falling from its number one spot. Flat Earth has never once even come close to passing boobs. I guess what I'm saying here is, press X to doubt. Not only is this a lie, but it's a lie that doesn't even matter. The popularity of a search term does not dictate the truth of the claims behind those search terms. Case in point, searching for evolution is generally less popular than searching for boobs. Except in Hawaii for some reason. You okay out there, Hawaii? But evolution is still true, despite being less popular of a search term. Though it is still more popular than flat earth. Now, why am I spending so much time on this? because it shows a willingness to bend the truth, if not outright lie, in order to push their narrative. It establishes that this video is not a trustworthy source of information, because they can't even be bothered to verify simple shit like this that takes pretty much no effort. While most of you were falling for the political charades, the rest of us were trying to discover the true nature about our world. See, now they can't even stay internally consistent on this point. If most of us were falling for the political charades while the select few minority are looking to discover the real truth, then wouldn't we expect it to not be a popular search term? Pick a lane. There has never been one experiment that proves that the Earth is in motion. Look up Foucault's pendulum sometime. It's a pendulum that has a full 360 degree range of motion. The way it works is a direct result of the Earth being not flat, because the Earth is an oblate spheroid, which for simplicity's sake for the rest of the video I will be abbreviating to just sphere or spherical, unless the irregularities in the shape of the sphere become relevant. But because the Earth is a sphere, as the sphere turns, the surface at the equator must move faster relative to the center of the Earth than the surface near the poles in order that they might make a full rotation in 
within the same amount of time, since a point on the equator travels a greater distance in that same time than the point near the poles. With a pendulum, as the bob swings back and forth, it is slightly changing latitude throughout the course of the swing. Each swing brings it either closer to or farther away from the equator. As such, its velocity is subject to slight variations throughout the course of each swing, which applies torque to the pendulum and pulls it away from its original orientation. Such pendulums can be found in science museums around the world, and simple versions are relatively easy to construct yourself if you don't trust that the museums don't have motors or whatever that are gradually shifting the swing. Bonus, you can actually use the rate at which the pendulum changes direction to calculate your current latitude using Foucault's sign law. So in this one relatively simple experiment, we have proof not only that the Earth moves, but that it is a sphere. Flat Earth is literally debunked by hanging a weight on a wire and watching it swing. When you try to find the curvature of the Earth, it's nowhere to be found. This is actually kinda sorta true, as long as we're talking about going up and seeing the curvature of the Earth with still images. But that's not because the Earth is not curved, it's just a matter of how perspective works. When you go up, no matter what altitude you hit, it will essentially still look like a disk. But the thing is, the higher up you go, the farther away the horizon goes, which is a phenomenon that would only happen on a spherical Earth. If it were flat, the horizon would just be the edge of the Earth, assuming no objects were physically obstructing it. This is most easily visible when there's a large flat area, so large bodies of water are where it's easiest to see. The classic example is, of course, watching a ship go over the horizon, disappearing from the bottom up, as would be expected if it was reaching the visible edge of the sphere that it's on. And for the same reason, because it's going over the edge of the sphere, if you were to raise yourself up and increase your altitude, you'd be able to see that ship again. Unless you're looking at footage from GoPro cameras that have fisheye lenses, Hollywood movies, or NASA propaganda. Yeah, the fisheye lens thing is no secret at this point. Of course movies exaggerate things, and I guess the only reason you have to call NASA propaganda is because if we're looking at the NASA pictures, places that we know for a fact exist are never visible at the same time, on account of them being on opposite sides of the globe. So you won't see Korea clearly visible at the same time as Florida, because they are on opposite sides of of the globe. But we can verify that both Florida and Korea exist, so they must be accounted for on the map somehow. But here's the thing, if the Earth were really flat and NASA were trying to just hide that fact for some reason, why would they not just design a bigger globe with nothing but ocean on one half of it leaving the flat Earth map pretty much intact on one side of the globe? That way they wouldn't need to pull weird flight plan shenanigans like flat earthers accuse them of, which I don't think this video goes into, but to briefly summarize, they claim that you can't get a direct flight from South America to Australia, because to do that flight on a flat earth map would take a lot longer than it would on a globe map. Like, a lot longer. And so they hide that fact by flying in an Australia-ish direction, but stopping in either Europe or Africa along the way. This is of course not true, though such flights are rare because that flight path takes you much farther away from land and safe landing spots in emergency situations than flight paths that stop in places like Florida or South Africa. But these flights do exist, and even if they didn't, this would still mean that every commercial airline pilot would have to be in on the conspiracy. In 2019 there were a total of 333,000 active airline pilots, so that's not including retirees or trainees, and somehow not one of these people has ever decided to come forward with the truth that the Earth really is flat? Why do you think that is? And actually that's a good question in general. What even is the goal of pretending that the Earth was a globe when it's actually flat? What do these people gain from that deception? And while we're at it, where's my portion of whatever payout pilots are supposed to be getting to keep quiet? I'm not a pilot, but I do have some flight experience under my belt, and my training went far enough that I can see just how nonsensical planning routes around a flat earth map is. And I know we're already on a tangent here, but to tangent my tangent, I found pictures of the exact plane I trained in, so I had a nice little trip down memory lane. It was fun. You're living in a world where there's fake people faking events on TV in order to move agendas forward. What agenda though? What exactly is the end goal of people claiming the Earth is round? I mean, I know today the goal is supposed to be income tax dollars that go to space agencies for funding their fake programs, and since their programs are all fake, and apparently all these agencies are working together in perfect harmony, they just get to pocket the money. 
But, I mean, making movies with those kinds of special effects is an expensive process that involves a lot of people that would have to be paid a lot more than their actual movie-making counterparts in order to get them to shut up about it, and with that many people involved, I'm sure more than a few would recognize the potential for double-dipping by publishing exposés about the subject. But all of this ignores the origin of the idea that the Earth is a sphere. The earliest records we have for anyone teaching the spherical Earth are from Plato in the 3rd century BCE, 2300 years ago. Plato's student, Aristotle, noticed that the stars were different in Egypt than they are further north, something that would only be possible if the Earth were a sphere. Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth using his famous experiment measuring the curvature by comparing the angles of shadows at two distant locations on the Earth, and he had it right to within a few percent. So the shape of the Earth has been known for thousands of years now, well before the idea of using tax dollars to fund space exploration would have been a feasible way to get some easy cash. So what was their motivation? And what was the motivation for all the scientists between them and the creation of the first space agency in the 1950s? Sometimes the reasoning cited will be anti-religious reasoning, as if the shape of the Earth gives us an excuse to sin or whatever, but Christian scholars throughout the Middle Ages often mentioned a spherical Earth, along with references to scripture to back up this view, so despite a common view that Columbus proved that the Earth was round with his voyage across the Atlantic, Nobody doubted that the Earth was a sphere at that point. The sphericity of the Earth has been an established fact of science for longer than it would have been feasible as a means for financial gain, and it was an idea that was promoted by many prominent church leaders, up to and including the Pope on a couple of occasions. Even Google mentioned it during their commercial. Do you remember this? Why would Google be promoting this? Was Google promoting Flat Earth? Or is that just a commercial for Google Earth and they were showing how it could be used in a web-based application, a use case that would involve viewing it on a monitor? You know, a device with a flat surface? As a joke? As a joke? No. We know why. Yes, of course, when in doubt about someone's motivation for doing something, just assume you know the reason and that it's the worst possible one. That always works out. They were panicking. Oh, it's cute that you think they were panicking. I guess we're back to the idea that the Flat Earth was a popular idea that just about everyone was searching for now? Make up your mind. Panicking because the platform they purchased ten years ago was collapsing with truth. The powers that be would not allow that. Actually, one of the major problems that YouTube has, and has always had as far as I know, is that the algorithm that decides what videos to recommend to you tends to recommend the more inflammatory videos, the idea seeming to be something like wanting to drive more engagement. Views equal money. More engagement equals more views, which equals more money. If you plunk this sort of algorithm down and just start it off completely neutral when it comes to the content of the videos that it promotes, it will naturally gravitate toward promoting more controversial videos because people engage more with controversy than they do with the more milquetoast content. It doesn't matter if it's positive engagement or negative engagement, engagement is engagement. So the panic from YouTube isn't that people are going to learn that the Earth really is flat, just add a few hundred more YouTube employees to the ever-expanding list of people on the payroll of the conspiracy, thereby by diminishing the pool even further. The panic, if we can call it that, is from the idea that they could be held accountable for what they host on their site. If content creators see that they get more views for being more controversial, they will, consciously or subconsciously, push themselves into being more controversial. Eventually, you get to stuff that is factually inaccurate, often to the point where it causes real-world harm, including medical misinformation, anti-science propaganda, and conspiracy theories like QAnon and, yes, Flat Earth. So. Did they panic? A bit, yeah, sort of. Did they panic because they were worried that people were learning that the Earth is really flat? Certainly not. If anything, they are financially motivated to allow that sort of content to continue unopposed because of the aforementioned ad dollars and controversy driving engagement and views and all that stuff. So instead of deleting all of the millions of videos we have made, they simply decided to bring in their puppets to reiterate the agenda at stake. Well, guess I'm a corporate YouTube puppet now. Can I have my paycheck, or did my whole thing about how YouTube is financially motivated to promote controversial material disqualify me from that? Wait, do I get a double paycheck for being both a pro-spherical Earth YouTuber and for having enough pilots training to know that the Earth cannot possibly be flat? I should be rolling in the dough. They want you to search for it. Because they already changed their algorithm to be set up in their favor. 
No, they were actually forced into changing the algorithm into being less profitable for them by promoting real and uncontroversial things over false and controversial things. Side note, the videos that you can see in their video here from the Professor Dave Explains series on destroying the flat earth without using science are excellent, and I highly recommend them. There's lots in there where you can demonstrate the non-flatness of the earth yourself without having to get into the weeds, scientifically speaking. What is this track? None of this tells you our side of the story. These are all videos they put together, so you can watch and learn nothing. I mean, on the one hand, there are people putting together explanatory videos with a lot of simple experiments that a sufficiently interested person can perform themselves without relying on being told what to think by this nebulous them that you keep referencing, and on the other hand are people that seem to mostly just rely on far-flung ideas about massive conspiracies that, considering the number of people that would need to be involved, it's entirely possible that there would be more people in on the conspiracy than there would be people that are supposed to be fooled by the conspiracy. I mean, we have not just the aforementioned movie casting crew, but also experts in essentially all of the sciences, and all of the amateurs in those sciences, and a good chunk of the students that are learning in those fields. And as I mentioned earlier, I have enough training as a pilot that I would need to have been inducted into the conspiracy in order for my training to have progressed as far as it did. But here's the thing with that. I made it through ground school, which takes about 45 hours to complete, and in my actual flight training I never even got to the point where my instructor would have signed off on a solo flight, which typically happens after around 15 hours of training. So with what amounts to one week of full-time ground school training and less than 15 hours of actual experience flying the airplane, I got to the point where either the earth would have to be round, or else I would have to have been inducted into the conspiracy and I guess paid to keep quiet about it? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the number of people who get to this tipping point where they'd either have to be inducted into the conspiracy or else realize that the Earth really is a globe is significantly large to make financially bribing all of them to keep quiet untenable, even if you combine the budgets of all the space agencies in the world. I mean, including government and private companies, total space exploration budgets amount to about $447 billion annually as of 2020. Every scientist in the world would have to be in on that, as every field of science in the world either directly or indirectly disproves the flat earth, like to an even greater degree than they do with young earth creationism, and that's an estimated 8.8 .8 million people. So if we divvy that up between all the scientists, that's about $50,000 per scientist per year. And that's not including all the students who have progressed far enough that they would need to be included in this, but not far enough to be counted as a scientist. It's also not including all the pilots, or all the would-be pilots who managed to make it through a couple weeks of training, or the amateur astronomers, or the film cast and crew that keep it going, and so on and so forth. Nothing that any of us would show you. Like here, have you ever seen a time lapse of the sun? Does it look like the earth is rotating backwards and the sun is still? Or does it look like our sun is simply moving across our sky, traveling away from your perspective? No, nope, the first one. It looks like the earth is rotating away from the sun. You know, on account of the fact that it goes down to the horizon and then below it, and it illuminates clouds from below as it does so, something that it wouldn't be able to do if it stayed at the same altitude up above the clouds? Yeah, but with some inversion. You can clearly see the sun, not only decreasing its size, but heading towards its next destination, with a slight turn. Is it decreasing in size, or is it just that when you point a camera at a very bright light source, it causes a lens flare that makes it appear larger than it is, and so as the sun gets dimmer throughout the course of the sunset, this flare gets smaller, causing it to appear to shrink. For comparison, here's two pictures that I took myself of the flashlight on my phone. On the left, the brighter picture was taken with an ISO of 400 and a shutter speed of around half a second. On the right is the same light source at the same distance, but taken with an ISO of 100 and a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. The result is that this light source, which is the same light source in both pictures, looks a lot smaller in the picture on the right. 
Now, if this were the phenomenon that's causing this to happen with sunset time lapses, we'd expect to be able to figure it out by taking a time lapse ourselves with an appropriate lens filter and appropriately dialed in exposure settings. If the Earth were flat and the Sun were actually shrinking because of perspective as it recedes away, we'd expect to still see that. If it's a sphere, though, and the Sun just sinks below the horizon as the Earth rotates, then we'd expect to see the size change go away. What do we see when we do this? We see the size change go away. It stays roughly the same size throughout the whole process with minor distortions as the light passes through the atmosphere. Before it disappears from your line of sight. Thing is, though, it wouldn't disappear from your line of sight in the Flat Earth model. Unless you change the physics of how light moves, the sun would always be visible, even when it's on the other side of the planet, unless there was something physical in the way blocking the light. And then the question becomes, why can't we see this physical thing that blocks the light from reaching the dark parts of the Earth when the sun's over us? We're told that the sun is a massive ball of burning gas 93 million miles away. But if that were true, then all the light that arrives here would be parallel because it's so far away. Right. And it is. That's why sundials work. And it has to be parallel, because one of the most often cited supposed globe proofs is Eratosthenes' experiment between Alexandria and Syene, by which he calculated the size of the Earth. Yep. That experiment would not have worked if the sun's light was not parallel. But that experiment did work, so... For that calculation to be accurate, the light must come down parallel. The only problem is that that's not what we see. Yeah, I figured this is where that was headed. To put it simply, sunbeams, or crepuscular rays if you want to be verbose, appear to converge on the sun in a non-parallel fashion, for the same reason that if you stand on a straight train track, the two parallel sides of the track will appear to converge in the distance. Hell, you showed a drawing of that earlier in your own video, where lines that are clearly supposed to be perceived as being parallel had to be drawn from a convergence point in order to create the illusion of being parallel, because that's how the perception of actual parallel lines works in the real world. To say that sunbeams are not actually parallel because they don't look parallel is to also say that train tracks are not parallel because they don't look parallel, and trains must just keep flipping their wheels around in the same manner as Tarzan sliding down tree branches in the Disney rendition. In reality, you can actually see this illusion yourself. It's more pronounced the closer you are to where the sunbeam quote-unquote hits. If you are far enough away and viewing the scene at a perpendicular angle, the sunbeams actually do appear to be parallel, in much the same way as viewing a train track from the side shows its rails to be parallel despite how they appear when standing on the track and looking down its length. The reason you'd even think the sun would be visible from anywhere on Earth is because of the images they have shown you. Ah yes, the infamous they again. Okay, well how about you show us an image of the flat Earth that has a sun that works consistently and predictably? You can't because it's impossible with the flat Earth model. Because of the tilt of the Earth, there are times of the year when a good chunk of Antarctica has sunlight for 24 hours a day, while the North Pole has darkness for 24 hours a day. On a globe, this makes perfect sense. The part of the rotating ball pointed toward the light gets more light than the part that's pointed away. But on the flat Earth, you'd have to somehow have a day-night pattern that looks something like this map that I threw together here, where the light just bends around North America, Asia, Australia, and Eastern Europe to leave them in darkness, while it somehow illuminates the Antarctic ice wall, or whatever you say it is that's on the other side of them. Flat Earthers will often use the general inaccessibility of Antarctica to claim conspiracy, even though you can book trips there yourself right now. They're not cheap, but at $10,000 per person, they're not completely unattainable either. But even ignoring this, there are places in South America that, in a flat Earth model, should be illuminated at the same time as places in Alaska, but aren't. And these are real places where people live, places you can go to check for yourself if you really wanted to. But what really takes the cake here is that you are claiming that we only think the sun would be visible from anywhere on Earth in a flat Earth model because of the images that quote-unquote they have shown you. But the problem is, a lot of the images you're showing here are images that are used by flat earthers. Because flat earthers have to use such images because they don't have a working model of their own, as any model of a flat earth that would fit observations of reality would require the breaking of several laws of physics in order to work. 
You can keep believing in your fantasy gas ball 93 million miles away. You can keep believing in your fantasy gas ball. While we keep experimenting to try and figure out what the sun actually is. I mean, the fantasy gas ball model has made testable predictions that thus far have failed to not come true. Things like the timing of solar eclipses and predicting the positions of various heavenly bodies at certain times. And it all works. Meanwhile, you guys aren't experimenting to figure out what it is, you are scrambling to figure out ad hoc explanations for phenomena that work perfectly in a spherical Earth model, but don't fit any conceivable flat Earth model, like solar and lunar eclipses, the motions of the planets, the fact that different stars are visible to people living in opposite hemispheres, gravity, etc, etc, etc. Imagine a table two meters wide in a completely dark room. And you're holding a, a small but very bright light bulb, 3.4 millimeters across. And you were holding it about 31 centimeters above the table. What you'd see is a circular pool of light directly on the table, you know, beneath the light bulb. Yes, as you're showing here. Now, I challenge you. Draw a map of the flat Earth in which this circular pool of light is capable of illuminating the Earth in the manner that we observe out here in reality, with Alaska in complete darkness while the whole of Antarctica is lit up. You won't be able to do it, because that's not how light works. But on the other side of the table, it would be in darkness. Now, it seems to our mind that um, if you were on the uh, other side of the table, you would see the light, because it's, you know, above the, above the table. But that's not true, because on that part of the table, it's in darkness, meaning that the light isn't physically reaching that part of the tabletop. Okay, this is absolutely amazing, and I'm sorry for those of you listening to the podcast because this is entirely visual, but as he's explaining that the dark parts of the table would not be able to see the light source because it's in darkness, he's showing a video taken in the scenario with the camera in the dark part of the table. And guess what the camera can see perfectly clearly? That's right, it's the light source! You don't have to be in the direct path of illumination of a light source in order to be able to see that light source, as is demonstrated by this example that completely contradicts what this guy is saying. Bravo, sir. Well done. So what about the moon? We all witness the moon only illuminating the local clouds around it. That is because it is also a local light. Is the whole of flat Earth just a big, I don't understand how optical illusions or effects work, therefore the Earth is flat kind of thing? Like, no, it's not only illuminating the clouds directly in front of it, it's that when looking at the moon through clouds, the ones in between you and the moon are the ones you are most likely to see, because they're the ones where the light beams coming from the moon have the straightest shot from your eyeball to the moon, whereas any clouds not directly in between you and the moon would have to be refracting the light in just the right way in order to hit your eye. If you hang a semi-transparent curtain in your house somewhere, and shine a work light at the curtain, guess which part of the curtain would appear to be the brightest to you when you're looking through it? That would be the part that is directly in between you and the light, and this spot will move around as you move, because the whole curtain is indeed illuminated, but most of the light that gets through it is the light that is passing straight through it, so you see the light best that is in a direct path back to the light. All this to say that the moon does in fact illuminate all of the clouds, but we notice the effect more when looking directly at the moon through clouds directly in between us and the moon rather than off to the side. Take a commercial flight at night sometime when there's a full moon, you'll see what I mean then. And while normally I would hope that this would go without saying, I fear that it doesn't for flat earthers. My referencing the moon here as a light source is not in any way contradicting the fact that the sun is the ultimate source of light for the moon. It's just a simplification so I don't have to say that every time I mention it. But yes, the moon does reflect sunlight. But one with opposite effects from the sun. As we can all agree, shade from the sun is cooler than direct sunlight. But did you know? The moon's shade is actually warmer than direct moonlight? No, that is demonstrably not true. There are a number of tricks that flat earthers will pull to get these results, but if you control the experiment properly, it's just flat out not the case that moonlight has a cooling effect. Often these experiments will rely on a shaded area, where the object providing the shade will also be trapping the heat that escapes from the earth, causing the air in the shaded portion to be slightly warmer, or else they will take the cooler temperature over a surface like grass, and the warmer temperature over a surface like concrete. 
There is an excellent video by a channel called Greater Sapien that demonstrates this experimentally, and shows how you can get a setup that uses this effect to get warmer temperatures in the moonlight than shaded from it. And for bonus points, he shows how the phases of the moon not only show that the sun is a source of light for the moon, but also that the sun must be far away from the moon. It's an easy experiment, all you need to do it yourself is a ball and a day when the sun and moon are both visible in the sky together. Not only that, but at times we can see stars through the moon, proving it is not some solid rock 238,900 miles away. Really? Because I've never seen a star through the moon. You'd think that if this were a real thing that happened sometimes, there would be, you know, photographic evidence of it that you might provide in this video, rather than relying on footage of the moon that's so shaky and blurry that you can barely even tell what's going on. Yeah, there was a white pixel or two on what would have been the shaded portion of the moon in that footage, but it is so degraded at this point that I'm not even sure if that's what you wanted me to notice there. Anywho, all it takes is a pair of binoculars to see that you can actually still see the shaded portion of the moon illuminated with Earthshine. And once again, this is something that you can do yourself. It's still there, it doesn't go away. In fact, find a dark enough location and you can even see that without a pair of binoculars. Now, do pictures exist where there are white dots in the dark portion of the moon? Yes. What are they? Probably satellites. I don't know for sure, but what I can tell you for sure is that they are not stars. Why is that? Because I dabble in photography. You need a low exposure to properly capture the moon, and a high exposure to capture the stars. Typically you would use a fast shutter speed for the moon with a low to medium ISO, and a slow shutter speed for the stars with a medium to high ISO, depending on exactly what your goal is with the picture. And from briefly browsing through the ultra grainy pictures that flat earthers often post that supposedly see stars through the moon, I can tell you that the moon is usually pretty well exposed in these pictures, which would mean that the exposure time was not long enough or the ISO was not high enough to register stars. Bonus, this is why there are no stars in the pictures from the astronauts on the moon. In order to capture the stars, they would have had to overexpose everything else. There have been a lot of bonuses in this video. In the 60s, true science regarding the moon was the shadow banned topic of its era. I um, consider myself to be an ordinary humble person who wants to serve mankind with what we, man has striven for from the beginning of consciousness truth and understanding of the world. Yes, Professor R. Foster, a man about whom we can find no information except for this one interview, in which he claims that his ideas are going to essentially overturn all of gravitational science. That means there is no more explanation for the tides. If the moon, for example, had only a thousandth part of its current mass, then the tides would only be two inches high and the conventional theories instead of sometimes 14 feet. And that means that if it is proved that the moon is a plasma, then all gravitational theories are out, and the new concept of the cosmos and of its laws has to be evolved. Well, here we are nearly six decades later, and gravity still works the same way as it did in the 60s. Of course, our understanding of gravity is imperfect, and scientists are working to improve it, but Plasma Moon Guy was wrong, plain and simple. One thing, you have a theory about the moon, and we expect to be able to get observable facts about the moon fairly soon. Um, what is your theory? Well, uh, it is by now rather more than a theory. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I stated to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is a plasma, cosmic plasma. Gravitational theories are out, and the new concept of the cosmos and of its laws has to be evolved. This fact will eventually be confirmed. I made certain predictions which were already confirmed in 1958, and the situation now is coming close to a complete confirmation. Yep, that is what he said. But he was wrong. The moon is made of rock, and despite what I'm sure this video is about to claim, we did land men on the moon, which would not have been possible if it were plasma. Notably, this professor was not actually a flat earther. He fully expected that we'd be able to land people on Mars or Venus, he just didn't think the moon was made of rock. But the, the Americans and Russians are thinking of landing men on it. Oh, well, that will never happen. Not on the moon. On Mars, on Venus, on other planets, yes, but the moon is definitely, as I assert, a plasma. Now, I just want to play one more snippet of their video before we go, because it's another spot where it shows dishonesty on their part. Because they play the portion of the interview that I just did, except they cut it off at a different spot. Let's see what happens there. The Americans and Russians are thinking of landing men on it. Oh, well, that will never happen. People actually believe they walked on the moon. There we go. 
They make the case that this must have been some great scientist who was silenced for speaking out about the flat Earth. At least that's the only reason I can think of that they would even bring him up. But in order to make that case, they have to cut the portion of the video where he clearly demonstrates that he would not agree with flat Earthers about anything but the idea that the moon is made of plasma. Okay, this one's getting long, so I'll continue this later. I'm having fun with this, it's a nice little change from my usual shtick. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Paul, who says, The only reason you think humans came from Africa is that monkeys and black people are from there and that they must be related. Racist much? Well, Paul, the only way that could actually be racist would be for me to not think that other humans were related to black people, which they are. All humans are related. And... All humans are related to monkeys, and the degree by which we are related to monkeys is the same no matter which people group you look at. No group of people is more closely related to monkeys than any other group of people. The reason we think people originated in Africa is because that's where all of the archaeological evidence points to as being the origin place for modern humans. There's a reason there are no early hominid fossils in the Americas. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Bryn Pound, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Ketchum, and all the rest, who are the sunsets that prove the flatness of my channel. If you'd like to recede over the horizon like a flat earth sun wouldn't, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me Stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! I mean, the fantasy gas ball model has made testicle, test, testicle predictions. <laughs> Big gas ball, testicle, same thing. <laughs>